Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we're gathered here together in your name. We glorify you, for you are worthy of every, every thought that we think. You are worthy of every breath that we take. You are so glorious in this house and in the midst of your people. Father, we thank you that you are restoring. You are restoring the, the Hebraic foundations of our faith. We thank you for what this time represents. That, Lord, that we, we know that it was during this time that you sustained your people. You sustained Judah when they came after the Torah and, and he wanted to wipe out the Torah, the spirit of Amalek. You preserve the Torah so that we can stand here today and learn your glorious ways and come back and understand your glorious instructions for your people. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your sustaining hand in our brother Judah. And we rejoice that that day is coming as your word declares in Ezekiel 37 that the day is coming when, the, when the, the branch of Judah and the branch of the house of Israel will one day again be reunited in your hand and be one nation that stands before you and Yeshua will be our king and your Torah will instruct us and lead us in your ways of righteousness. We thank you for this and everybody in this, in this place said... Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Leviticus 20. Let's roll. I've got just a short message here for you this morning. It won't take more than three hours. <laughs> Hold it silent. Here we go. We're going to start in verse 22 of Leviticus 20. Do I keep saying this morning? Yeah. 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 I'm not used to sleeping in. I, I slept in so late on on, 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 on Shabbat. I, mean, I, I get up and get rolling. Hallelujah. So let's start this morning. I mean this afternoon. Yeah. I'll do it again. It'll, it'll happen. So, verse 22. The Father says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and all my judgments and perform them and the land where I am bringing you to dwell, that the land that I'm, where I am bringing you to, to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nations which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord, I am Yahweh your Elohim, who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make uh, yourselves abominable by beast or by bird, or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I, Yahweh, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Listen to that wording. The Father says, I have separated you from all of the people. I've given you my statutes, I've given you my instructions, so that you might be set apart. Do you know that this word right here, separated, is the Hebrew word badal, B-A-D-A-L. And it's the same word that is used in Genesis 1-4. Bring up the word badal real quick. Let's look and see what it says. To divide, to separate, to set apart, to make a distinct, with distinction, to make a difference. So the Father says, I have separated you from all the peoples. And this is the same word that's used in Genesis 1-4. That says, and Yah saw the light, that it was good, and Yah divided the light from the darkness. So the Father says, I've given you these things to divide the light from the darkness, to divide you from the rest of the nations. Now we know what light is, right? We know how the scripture defines light. In Proverbs 6, verse 23, says, for the commandment is a lamp, the Torah a light, reproofs of instructions are the way of life. I think that was on their bread. And then also in Isaiah 8, we know what darkness is, Isaiah 8.20. To the Torah and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, is because there is no light in them. So our Father said, just as I divided, just as I separated the light from the darkness in the day, I separated you from all of the nations around you. Your Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all about a people being set apart. Hallelujah. Amen. Everything in this word is about you and I being set apart. It's about being dedicated unto him or Hanukkah. Can I turn Hanukkah into a verb? Amen. It's about being Hanukkah before him, set apart, dedicated, consecrated to him. People say, well, show me Hanukkah in the Bible. Just hand them your Bible and say, it's right here. From Genesis to Revelation, we are supposed to be set apart.
apart and dedicated unto him. And that's what the word Hanukkah means. Every aspect of the Torah that he is teaching you, every uh, the atonement that has been found in Yeshua, that we are to be purifying ourselves as he is pure. All of this is about being dedicated or Hanukkah unto him. In fact, your whole life, every moment of every day that you're living right now, every moment you are supposed to be pressing towards being more Hanukkah, more dedicated unto him, more set apart, more separated from this world. Every day progressing towards greater dedication unto the Father. You know, some are always questioning the Torah. And they'll question, they'll question commandments, even in this walk. And they'll say, well, you know, what do you really think that, that the Father meant by this? And then we'll take a Torah commandment and we'll just analyze that thing to death. We'll look at it from every angle. We'll just, you know, we'll, 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 we'll work it out. And some will say, well, it means this. Others will say, say, well, then it means this. And I really don't think it applies to this. And I don't think it applies to you. Can we just sit back and relax and understand something? That his Torah is given to us to separate us. To separate us. So whether or not the commandment absolutely makes sense to my peanut brain or not, it doesn't matter. If the Father said, this is what I want you to do, then I need to do it because it's about my separation. It's about me coming out of this world and being dedicated, Hanukkah, unto Him. And so, whether or not I understand it, it doesn't matter. The Father said, do it. Let's just do it. And let's let the Ruach separate us from all of this world, from the mindsets of this world. How many know it's not an easy thing? It's not an easy thing. Every time we turn around, we're having to deal with with something that we've learned, something in our in our Roman or Greco-Roman mindset that just runs completely contrary to the Father and to His ways. And I find that every single day when I when I come before Him and I'm seeking His face and I'm reading His Word, it, it, it almost is overwhelming. You read these things and you're like, this is so contrary to what I am right now. And, and how many know that this is not going to change? The one that needs to change is me. He's not going to change his word for me. I've got to adjust. I've got to read this. And only you know it takes courage. It takes courage to read this word and to go at, go at this and say, you know what? My life is not lining up with this word and this word is not going to change for me. I've got to change me. I've got to trust the spirit of God to walk me through this and change me. Take out that hard heart out of me and, and teach me how so that my life is lining up with every aspect of this word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, you can, you can amen me, amen, amen me. You're not going to scare me. Hallelujah. I got a, I got a Pentecostal background. You're not going to scare me. Hallelujah. Come on. <laughs> but the word Hanukkah is actually in your Bibles. Hallelujah. It's strong word 2598. You're going to see it in Numbers chapter 7, verse 10, 11. The word Hanukkah. In the Hebrew means dedication, consecration. Dedication, consecration. The altar in number seven was Hanukkah. If you read that and you read it in the Hebrew, the altar was Hanukkah. The, the house of Yahweh was Hanukkah. The wall of Jerusalem was Hanukkah. What is that saying? That is saying when they're Hanukkahing that altar, they're saying there will never be a sacrifice to any other God on this altar, but to Yah alone. They're saying this altar is dedicated to Him. This will, there will be no sacrifice offered to anybody other than Yah on this altar. They're saying it's dedicated, set apart for His service and His alone. In our fellowship, we've been going through the last couple of weeks, we've been examining this, this passage here in 1 Peter. Let's read this together. Look at what, 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 what the Word says. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Yah and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yah through Yeshua Messiah. You're called a holy priesthood. How many know that the priesthood was set apart and dedicated to his service and his alone? 
So we've been going through, and we've been looking at the whole at the priesthood, and then we've been comparing it to what it says in Leviticus 21 about all the different blemishes that are on the priesthood that disqualify a priest for service. It's amazing. If you're interested in it, you can pull it up online. We've got it online. It's, it's, it, each of those blemishes not only has a spiritual or a physical, when you're talking about a broken hand, a broken foot, a flat nose, the Father says, if any priest who has these blemishes cannot minister before me. And you look and you say, well, not only were those physical aspects, but every single one of them has a spiritual picture involved in it. Even the flat nosed priest. The flat nosed priest is one that we looked at. A flat nosed priest is one who lacks discernment, if you look it up and study it in the rest of Scripture. Father's not picking on, pick, he's not picking on priests that, no, Derek, you ain't going to get away with a nose like this. You know that? The Father said, as this man gets older, I'm just going to, it's going to be out to here by the time. Hallelujah. And you're like, man, that guy's got discernment. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he wasn't picking on priests that had, you know, little flat noses. What he's saying is, in the spiritual, the spiritual picture of a flat-nosed priest is one that has no discernment. Do you remember the phrase that says, you know, I smell a rat? Right? I got discernment. Something, I smell something fishy. It's discernment. Right? So in, so in, in uh, Song of Solomon chapter 7, when he's speaking to her and he says, oh, you've got a neck. Oh, a neck like an ivory tower. And you've got, you've got your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. And you're like, what kind of woman would fall for a line like that? That's amazing. I mean, come on, let's talk about sweet talk. Why did, try talking to your wife like that. What's that? What about it? No. But what does it say? It says, it no, your nose looks towards Damascus. It means keeps an eye on, spies out Damascus. So he's saying, you have a nose like the Tower of Lebanon. And why is it pointing toward Damascus? Because Damascus is where the enemy is. Saying, you have a big nose. But what he's really saying to her in the Hebrew is he's saying, you have incredible discernment, my love. That's what we should be pushing towards. But we've been going through each of these things because it's so important that we understand that you are called to be a priesthood. I am called to be a priesthood, a royal priesthood, a set-apart group of ministers to minister unto the Father. And, and Peter says, you are a royal priesthood. Priesthood, a holy priesthood. He goes on to say a royal priesthood in verse 9. So the priesthood, what were they responsible for? They were responsible for remaining dedicated unto his service and unto his service alone. They were responsible for not only for themselves being dedicated, set apart for him, but they were responsible for keeping the temple dedicated, set apart for him. They were responsible. The, the, the Father kept them, kept them accountable. Don't let anything in my temple that defiles my temple. The new covenant not only refers to us as a holy priesthood, but the new covenant also refers to the consecrated believer as his temple. Hallelujah. You are the temple. You are the temple of the Most High. As a priest, as one who is called to be a holy, set apart, dedicated priesthood, which is what you are called to, you are responsible, as Peter said, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yah through Messiah Yeshua. And Father is adamant that his temple remain dedicated unto him. This is a serious, this is a serious matter in the eyes of the Father. That if he says, You are my temple. I have hanukkah you in the blood of Messiah. I have washed you. I have cleansed you. I have dedicated you. Now, you don't let anything in you that defiles. How many know that we live in a world and in a culture that defilement is constantly coming our way? By the things that we see, the things that we hear, we live in this culture that, is con that everything is just impure and, and just full of defilement. So here we are navigating our way through these things. But the Father says, listen, I take this serious. I take my temple serious. I want to dwell in you. I want to dwell in the midst of my people. But you've got to, you've got to, you've got to keep that temple dedicated unto me. Look at what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, do you know that you are the temple of Yah? And that the spirit of Yah dwells in you. If anyone defiles the temple of Yah... Yah will destroy him, for the temple of Yah is holy, which temple you are. 
How many know that's some pretty strong language? Do we realize that Messiah Hanukkah us? If I could turn it into a verb again. He Hanukkah this. He cleansed us. He dedicated us so that we would be vessels that the Father could dwell in, that would be cleansed, that would be purified, that His presence, His glorious presence would fill our lives. We want to know why we're not operating in greater realms of authority and power. Listen, we better start paying attention to what's going on with the temple. Hallelujah. When the Father gave that warning in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and He said, when you, when you find these idols, He said, don't even want the silver and the gold that are on them. Destroy it all. He says, because if you take that accursed thing into your home, you know what's going to happen? You're going to be accursed. Just like that thing is accursed. I promise you right now, idolatry is in every single one of our homes. Now, we're little by little, we're getting it out, right? Little by little, we're getting it out. But it is so in, in, entrenched in this culture that, that the quicker we move towards what he has called us to. That's why the father said that to Israel when Achan took the treasures. You remember that? He took the treasures and the father said, the father said, he came to him in, 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 in uh, uh, Joshua chapter 7. And he said, he said Israel has sinned. Right? They've uh, Achan had taken the treasures and put them into his tent. And the father said, you, because of this, you will not be able to stand up against your enemies. That's a serious matter. He says, you've taken, someone from your camp has taken that paganism, that idolatry, into their tent. It's now in amongst your stuff. And he says, because of this, you will not be able to stand against your enemies. And he says, and I will not be among you. Man, this is a serious issue for all of us. We gotta get we gotta get serious with the Father. Because most people, listen, most people don't realize how much they have in common with the tabernacle of Moses. Have you ever studied that out before? How much you have in common with the tabernacle of Moses? Think about this. When the Father is giving Moses the instructions for the tabernacle, I promise you. I promise you that when he is giving Moses the instructions for the tabernacle, Moses is seeing the picture that the Father is trying to give him. He's seeing a bigger picture than just a structure that he says, I want to, I want to come and I want my presence to be in the midst of you. Why? Because Moses knows the words that are being right, used right here in the Hebrew. You and I get the English. We get ripped off. I heard somebody say, oh, I know that the language of, 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 of the kingdom of Messiah is going to be English. I said, oh, Father, I hope not. It's the dumbest language in the world. We don't even follow our own rules. Hallelujah. It tells us in Zephaniah chapter 3, he said that, I, that, he's going to, that he's going to restore unto the people a pure language. That we might call upon his name and worship him in one accord. Amen. I promise you it's not going to be English. Hallelujah. It's going to be the, the, the language he gave to his people. But we read these things, we read about the tabernacle, and we read it in the English, and we are missing such an important picture that the Father, that Moses had because he knew the language that the Father was using. So watch this, you've got, you got time, just give me a little time to run through some of these, and show you how much in common you have with the tabernacle of Moses. Exodus 26, let's turn there real quick. Stay with me, you're not going to want to miss this. Exodus 26. Verse 14. It says, You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent, and a covering of badger skins above that. And for the tabernacle, you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. So, right there, from that short passage of Scripture, what do we see? We see Moses getting a picture of where Yahweh says, I want my presence to dwell right here. I want an upright wooden structure. And I want it, and I want it to stand upright and I want it to be covered with skin. Are you getting a picture? An upright wooden structure, a wooden frame structure that's covered in skin. Not only was it covered with skin and it stood upright, but the tabernacle of Moses was movable, was it not? 
He could be taken as Yah would lead them. They would take that tabernacle and they, would, they, they could move by the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. So what do we have? We have an upright structure that is covered with skin that is able to move at Yahweh's leading wherever he leads for it to go. Something else you have in common with the tabernacle is the tabernacle had three parts. You've got an outer court, you've got an inner court, or a holy place, and you have the most holy place in the tabernacle. Look at what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says about you. Now may Yah, the Yah of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of Master Yeshua. As the tabernacle had three parts, you have three parts. This, when it says that may he sanctify you, this word sanctify is Strong's word 37. It means to separate from profane things, to dedicate to God. The measurements that were used for the construction of the tabernacle also reveal a great picture of what Moses saw. And what Moses walked through in the construction of the tabernacle, that each of the measurements that were used for its construction were, part, were from the average, the measurements of an average man. So when the father says this, he says, I want you to make this so many cubits. Does everybody know what a cubit is? A cubit is the distance from the elbow to the finger right here. This is a cubit. So the father said, I want you to make, uh, um, uh, for an example, for an example, that uh, uh, what do you use for the cubit? You use the uh, the curtains for the tabernacle were cubits. So what would they do? They would measure out that cubit from the elbow to the finger. You know what that became in culture? It actually became something that when the when a society would mark their measurements, it would be the it would be the distance of the king. It would be the distance of the king to his elbow to his finger, and that would become the cubit that was used. That's where the phrase ruler comes from. If you didn't know that. A little bit of, a little bit of uh, the rest of the story by, what's his name again? Paul Harvey. That's the rest of the story. So, so cubits. Then the father said, "I want you to build this so many hand breadths. A hand breadth is the distance across an average man's hand. Hand breadth. All right. So when he's when he's making the molding for the table of showbread, he's saying, "I want you to make it so many hand breadths across." All right. So, so using measurements of a man. Then the father says, "I want you to use the span." Everybody, who knows what a span is? Span. Yes, from the tip of the pinky to the tip of the thumb. And the father would say, like for the breastplate of the of the priest, I want you to make it a span. Either way. So you know you can now look and say, well, the average man is span of his hand is about like this. So I know that the breastplate on the priest was about yay big, the span of a hand. And I know the size of the breastplate. Hallelujah. So he's, he's, he's giving them incredible pictures of what this tabernacle is. Now just wait. We're just getting started. Watch us. Let's go a little bit deeper. Just in case Moses was struggling to comprehend the whole spiritual picture in this tabernacle that, that Yahweh says, I want to dwell in the midst of this, of, of this people. Build me a sanctuary. Yahweh starts using terminology that's used for body parts. We go to Exodus 26. Look at verse 19. It says, You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets from under the board, uh, from under each of the boards for its two tenons. Now, in our dictionary, a tenon is this it's a projection that is formed from the end of a piece of wood, is a tenon. But this word, this Hebrew word for tenon, is the word yad. Strong's word 30. 27, and it is a side, a part, a portion, a hand, a hand of a man. So the father is saying, I want you to make this, I want you to make it. It's also, it's also the same word that's used for a hand of a man. Another place you're going to see this word used is Genesis chapter 5 and verse 29. And he called his name Noah saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our yod which is that word tenon, because of the ground which Yahweh has cursed. Now we look at Exodus 25 and verse 12. Exodus 25 and verse 12 says, You shall cast four rings of gold for it, 
and put them on its four corners. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. This word for corners is the Hebrew word pa'am, P-A, apostrophe A-M. It's Strong's word 6471. Look at what this word means. Corner, time, foot, footstep, footstep, feet. Why is Yah using body parts when he's describing these portions of this tabernacle? One other place we're going to see this is in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 24. I have dug and drunk strange water, and with the soles of my pa'am, my feet, I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Exodus 27 and verse 9. Are you still with me this afternoon? Yes. Yeah. See, I said afternoon. I remember. Watch this. Exodus 27 and verse 9. Look at what the word says. You shall make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side there shall be a hanging for the court. Made of the woven linen 100 cubits long for one side. This word for side is the word pe'ah. P-E apostrophe A-H. And this is what it means. Corner, edge, side, properly, mouth in a figurative sense. So, so far, what do we see? We see that the tabernacle, it has hands, it has feet, and it has a mouth. Let's keep going. Actually, let's look at, let's, uh, yeah, let's look at Exodus 26 now. Exodus 26 and verse 10. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that it, in, uh, that is outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. This word edge is the word sefa. I know I'm going kind of fast. 8193, look at what this word means. Brim, side, edge, border, but look at what else it means. Lip, language, speech, lip as a body part. So now we see the tabernacle has hands, it has feet, it has a mouth, and it has lips. Where else do we see this word sephah used? We see it in Deuteronomy 23. And verse 23, that which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. For you have voluntarily vowed to Yahweh your Elohim what you have promised with your mouth. Does anybody else dig this kind of stuff? I dig this kind of stuff. I love it. I love digging into those words and going, oh my goodness. It's used not only for this, but also for this over here. Wow. Exodus 26. Exodus 26. I'm almost done. Let's keep going. Exodus 26 and verse 20. I know you've been sitting a long time, but hang with me. Verse 20. And the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards. Now, in English, all we get is the word side. Well, that just, that, that you know, it's really boring. We don't get the, the full view of what this word means. So the Father is saying, I'm going to that again. For the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards. This word side is the word selah. Look at what it means. Side, rib, beam, rib of a man. Selah. You're going to see this word used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his selah and closed up the flesh in its place. Do you think Moses is getting the picture of what this tabernacle is? He's using the same words for his body parts as he's using for this tabernacle. Let's keep going. Exodus 40 and verse 22. Exodus 40 and verse 22. Look what it says. He put the table in the tabernacle of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil. Now we read the word side again. But this is not selah, this word. This word is the Hebrew word yarek, Y-A-R-E-K. Look at what it means. Thigh, side, loin, thigh. Outside of the thigh where the sword is worn. Loins as the seat of procreative power. So we're hearing the word side, but Moses is hearing the word thigh or loin of a man. Where else you're going to see this is in Genesis 24 and verse 9. So the servant put his hand under the yarek of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Let's do another one. Exodus 27. 
Exodus 27. Exodus 27 and verse 14. Look at what it says. The hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their pillar, three pillars and their three sockets. And on the other side shall the hang, be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. Now stop for a second. And he, this is the word side. But the word side here is not the word salah. It's not the word yerek. Okay? It's a different word. Does anybody want to guess what body part this is? What's that? Somebody's been studying. The socket gives it away. He says, put it in the socket. Yes, it is the word kathef. Shoulder, shoulder blade, side, shoulder, shoulder blade of a man. The place we're going to see this is in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 12. Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. So think about this tabernacle that Moses is, is, is following the instructions of the Father to build. The Father is saying to him, to him this, Moses, I want this, I want this tabernacle to have hands. I want this tabernacle, we'll start with this. I want this tabernacle to be an upright structure, and I want it to be covered with skin. I want this tabernacle to have hands. I want this tabernacle to have feet. I want this tabernacle to have a mouth, and I want this tabernacle to have lips. I want this tabernacle to have ribs. I want this tabernacle to have thighs. I want this tabernacle to have shoulders. Moses. You think Moses is getting the picture of what the Father is trying to show him? Listen. He had the picture. You're living in the reality that the Father wants to dwell in the midst of His people. He wants, to, he wants to set up camp in the midst of you. He wants to set it up in my life. Listen, this is, this is where we come in. You're called a priest, and you're called the one who looks after the tabernacle, the temple. You have a temple. I have a temple. What is this whole season about right now? This whole season is about the temple being cleansed, being pure before the Father. Messiah cleansed you. He washed you with His blood. Your sin that was scarlet has now been made white as snow. But listen to me right now. Priest, you are responsible from that day forth for keeping the tabernacle clean. The scripture says this that in John, in 1 John chapter, chapter 3, that when Messiah comes back, that we will be like he is. And all of us who have this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. Yes. See, so many times in doctrine, they want you to think that, well, you don't, you don't worry about a single thing. It, it's all Jesus came and just cleansed you up and he'll just continue to cleanse you up. Don't worry about a thing. But the reality is this. Scripture says that I'm holding you responsible, yes. priest, yes. for how clean your temple is. I'm holding you responsible. Now, listen, I'm not saying that you can save yourself. But what I'm saying is the Messiah has hanukkah you. Do you know when he said that in Jeremiah chapter 2, when he said that, your, that their, their iniquity has been written before him? That word, that word written literally means etched in stone. And he says, you can try to use liar, you can try to use soap. It ain't going to clean you up. Then he tells us in Malachi chapter 3 that the Messiah, that when his messenger comes, his messenger is going to, he's going to be the launderer's soul. He's going to clean us. He's going to cleanse us up. And that's exactly what he did when you brought yourself to him and you laid yourself at his feet. He cleansed you. But then he said, listen, you've got a responsibility now. Of how you look after the temple. And don't think for a second that the Father is going to take it lightly when we defile his temple. So anybody wants to get upset and say, well, this whole law thing, we want nothing to do with this Torah thing. Listen, we need his Torah. We need his instructions. Because we are a depraved people. You got, you're all a real nice people. I really like you a lot. But listen, you're, as, you're, 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 you're working through this just like I am. We need him. We need his cleansing. We need his leading of his spirit. And we need to take seriously this time of dedication unto him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as you go forth in this place, can we make a commitment as a, as a whole Torah community? That's what we are. We don't see everything eye to eye. We disagree on some things. But can I tell you something? That's all right. Because you're after the heart of the Father. I'm after the heart of the Father. 
We, uh, we understand that we are saved through our Messiah, Yeshua. He is the written word, or the living word, and we are to follow the written word as his people. Hallelujah. So we understand that. We understand that. And we don't have to see everything eye to eye. Listen, if we agree on everything, ain't, ain't neither one of us very smart. Come on. We, got, we wrestle with these things. and we don't, We're not a bunch of mind-numb robots out here. We wrestle with these things. And, and, and that's why I love times, I guess we get together, we sharpen each other. We say, well, I see the commandment saying this. Well, I see it saying this. This is all good stuff. But listen, can we make a covenant as the Torah community in East Tennessee, because this is where the Father has planted us. Can we make a commitment to each other that we throughout this year are going to press into being more dedicated to Him than we ever have? More dedicated, more set apart, more holy unto Him. We're going to say, you know what? I'm going to say no to those things because I don't want this temple to be defiled. I want my Father to find a home in me and glorify His name in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.